My name is Geoffrey Marsh. I'm uh, director of the Department of Theatre and Performance at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And our main exhibition in autumn 2016 is You Say You Want a Revolution, Records and Rebels, 1966 to 1970. Looking at the origins of the Roundhouse, it's uh, really important to look at the broader context of the growth of the counterculture in London in 1964, 65, 66. Because, of course, as people started coming together through things like the poetry incarnation at the uh, Royal Albert Hall, they wanted places to meet, and not the traditional places, but new places. And people like Arnold Wesker, very influenced by Joan Littlewood, her ideas about people palaces, where people could not just do traditional art forms, but could do poetry readings, and art, and discussions, and a radical film, and it all could be done uh, together in one place. So he had the idea about the Roundhouse, um, in, uh, in Chalk Farm, but other people were looking at uh, other places. Uh, Jim Haynes went on and created the Arts Lab, um, and of course there was a famous UFO club in Tottenham Court Road. But I think what all these people were looking for was a place where people could come together and talk, and I think that's the key thing about uh, this period. The idea was to try and explore new ways of living, new ways of thinking. Um, I suppose this goes back to people like R. D. Lang and his book The Divided Self. You know, People started to start questioning, who am I? The key thing was to try and find out what you were exploring inside yourself rather than looking at the outside world. But the key thing always, always, always was talking to other people, discussing things. After a period in the 1950s of kind of obviously much more sort of top-down people telling you what to do. I think central to that was also uh, music. Behind me we've got a uh, display about Sergeant Pepper. But obviously coming up through 65, 66, 67, you've got the start of, of uh, revolution in music, the rise of the LP as, a, as an art form in itself, something you sit down and you listen to over and over again, examining the lyrics well into the night. And also the rise of psychedelic music, which is obviously linked to taking drugs, particularly LSD. And um, of course, at the point when Arnold was starting his, uh, his project, LSD was perfectly legal in Britain. It was only made illegal, like in America, in late 1966. And in fact, um, the famous uh, IT event at, um, at the Roundhouse in October coincided with the, uh, uh, the criminalisation of LSD. But of course, up to that time, people took LSD because, um, not in a, so much in a kind of recreational way, but because it was it was the way to see the world in a new way. I think one of the other th uh, crucial things to remember is that in the London of the 1960s, there was pretty much full employment. And of course, accommodation was terribly cheap. And you could, you know, you could live very easily in London. You might be living in a flat, which by today's standards, people would turn their nose up, you know, wouldn't have a kitchen, uh, you know, there wasn't showers and that sort of thing. But it did mean that young people, particularly coming from all over uh, the country, could settle into London very, very easily. And if they wanted to drop out and do something for a couple of years, they knew they could come back and get a job. It was very different from nowadays. <laughs> it was a much more free and easy atmosphere. People had a lot more money. And of course, there was this huge boom, the baby boomers, people born in 45, 46, 47, who of course came teenagers and then were going into their early 20s in this sort of period. I mean, pubs then were pretty, pretty dour places. You know, nowadays, there was no gastro pubs. The pubs were places you went and drank you know, drank, not like nowadays. There was no food or anything like that. And obviously, they were very traditional. They, didn't, they weren't interested in kind of people with long hair who wanted to see funny films. So what you really get in places like the Roundhouse is the opportunity to do multimedia events and that people could move, they could go and see a play, they could pick up books. And of course, central to that also was the start of counterculture magazines, which provided the connections between these things because none of the events at the time, the political events, the artistic events, were advertised in the mainstream press. It's 2016 and apart from being the anniversary of the Roundhouse, it's, um, it's also the 500th anniversary of Thomas More's Utopia, which was the first book that really tried to examine the idea of imaginary worlds. Utopia means nowhere, so it was a kind of imaginary world, but where Moore wrote about the idea of, I suppose, what we call religious freedom and sort of, sort of gender equality. And so obviously over, over the years, you do get these different periods when you get this, uh, when the idea about exploring utopias um, rises to the surface. Uh, and it's usually a period when people have got I guess, the money and the time to actually think a bit about it. <laughs> um, and of course, what you've got is a period after the Second World War where people, uh, you've got the establishment of the welfare state. So the sort of basic building blocks of 
the world that we're used to now, national health service, were put in place in, in the late 40s. Um, but it was still a very traditional world in terms of the bigger picture. I mean, what was it all for? And I think that was the, um, the key thing that you see in, in, in the 60s, is people start imagining a completely different uh, world. Behind me, we've got uh, George Harrison's World Passport. It says in it, if you read it, it says George Harrison, I think, born by accident in Liverpool. So you have this idea of a world without boundaries, without borders, um, where with the colonies disappearing, idea of internationalism. Um, of course, rather ironic seeing the things that are being talked about today. But there was this genuine feeling that, you know, if everybody got together, you could create a kind of communal powerhouse for change. And I think that's at the uh, root of what was going on at places like the Roundhouse. In 1970, the Equal Pay Act was passed. So in the time that we're talking about, it was perfectly legal to pay women less for doing the same job. I mean, that seems completely unacceptable nowadays, but that was only 50 years ago. I think the other thing that's very interesting in terms of, uh, particularly about the arts and the Roundhouse, is, is this the idea of crossover between art forms. I mean, when you're in the 50s, you know, you have music and theatre, and it's very much in separate uh, avenues and in uh, separate buildings and separate audiences. Of course, what places like the Roundhouse did, because they were such extraordinary spaces, was that it, people could sort of mix stuff together. And obviously, apart from the music, um, people like Soft Machine and Pink Floyd, who were really pushing the boundaries of music, um, you get uh, organisations like the Living Theatre, who bring kind of completely new idea about how you, you construct theatre, how you write theatre. But of course, you then start getting it all put together and you get people a bit later on like, David Bowie appearing, and you know, at the start, before he becomes kind of Ziggy Stardust, he's already doing these performances at the Roundhouse, dressing up in weird outfits in a way which had been inconceivable a, a couple of years before. And I think that was the real legacies of, of the Roundhouse of that period, the idea that of, of people being able to own their own space and just do what they wanted without people worrying about what people thought about it. There's such a profusion of art spaces in London now. It's difficult to imagine a time when there were very, very few, and certainly of the size of the Roundhouse. And of course, down to this day, it is a unique space.